Okay, great. So it's, first of all, I think me and Ben are just are really privileged to be here. Um, it's fantastic to just be able to hit, you know, to be here and to be able to share this information with everybody. Um, so, so who are we? Uh, we are headhunters. That might that might mean something to some of you and to others. You might be thinking, Crumbs, what does that mean? So, really, really, all of our work. Um, and, I, and, and just to introduce myself, I've been a headhunter for probably about nineteen years. So I haven't been a graduate for, for, for a very long time. And, um, you know, ben, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, so I'm Ben Hewlett. I'm a partner at Granger East. Um, so similar to Edwards, I've been doing this for 21 years now, um, working with um, sort of engineering, construction and, and transport organisations. And I've been, I've been really focused on working for large property companies, real estate organisations, and, Gra and Granger East itself supports large global organizations natural resources companies energy companies transportation companies so there's a real sort of wide variety of whether it's in engineering or sort of you know uh, mining and transportation hs2 that was mentioned a, a while ago so um and what we wanted to try and do is we, me and ben both recognized that we are no longer experts when it comes to uh, uh, graduate recruitment. I don't think we perhaps ever have been, but we realised that what, what we have got that, that can add great value to, to everybody here is that we have access to our clients. So we interviewed, we took the time to interview uh, three of our clients and there were sort of quite different organisations and, and specifically within those clients, we interviewed their graduate recruitment teams, uh, which was really insightful. And so we interviewed uh, a, a, a sort of grad recruitment team from with a very large not-for-profit. Uh, 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 the same team, again, a graduate recruitment team within a sort of two billion pound turnover, UK focused construction business. And then we interviewed, again, another grad recruitment team from a sort of US Fortune 500 business, you know, 28 billion turnover operating globally, and they've got a really, really brilliant uh, UK graduate recruitment team. So we have the sort of pleasure of, um, of, of, you know, picking their brains and really getting out all of those interesting things in terms of almost hacks that we can then uh, impart onto you, which hopefully gives you a chance to be more successful when you do go through the process of trying to secure uh, a, a, a job or, or a place on a graduate programme. And I think probably just before we kick on, what I think me and Ben realised was that in the information we were given, it just became very apparent that the things we're going to share with you are actually applicable uh, to perhaps uh, applying for university, applying for a job, whether that be just be a summer job, and ultimately when you are uh, when you uh, seek to you know get a place on a graduate program. But actually, it would also be very relevant for you when you're a senior person one day, a future leader of a business or a future leader, in whatever it is that you choose to do. These sort of uh, principles, I think we could give this advice to somebody applying for a chief executive's role. So, um, so if I sort of uh, move on to the first slide, so um, over to you, Ben. Yeah, so look, I think this sort of leads on quite neatly from um, Kate's sort of discussion, which is that once you've actually sort of arrived at university, um, even though it'd be quite nice to sort of take a deep breath, that's when sort of, I think, the real hard work starts in terms of building towards your, your sort of career of choice, whether that's a postgraduate degree before, going on to your career or simply moving into education after your three years at university. Um, one of the things that was evident was that all of our clients said, look, universities, you know, over the last 20 or so years have really improved in terms of their connectivity to small and large organizations in terms of um, furnishing sort of good relationships, which allow graduates then to move into those organizations. So there's a huge amount of information and knowledge and connection between universities and future employers. And I think what they all said was, look, starting in year one, really important for all of you guys to start building really good relationships with the career service centers at whichever university or education establishment you end up at, because there's a huge amount of information, a huge amount of help, um, counseling and support available, which will start to give you an understanding of what do I have to start doing now in year one to make me really relevant for a graduate intake in year three or year four. So I think for us, our number one tip or first tip would be start early. And, you know, similar to what Kate was saying earlier, 
you know, that doesn't mean doing, you know, something every single day. It just means maybe sort of put together a journal and start to record things that are relevant and things that you believe and your sort of support, sort of people, people around you, maybe your mentor believes will have real value for you when you do start to apply for, for jobs in three to four years time. It's great. So, um, so what I want us to do now is we're thinking about how um, we could impart this information. And what we were thinking is let's try to put ourselves in the mind of a graduate recruiter. Or, or actually, in many respects, you could sort of think about if you, you know, some of the information that Kate just shared, which was brilliant. Um, if you're in that, if you're if you're the person doing the scoring, if you're the person doing the selecting, because actually what became really apparent in the three interviews that I conducted was that um, the graduate recruitment managers find the process of selecting um, uh, who will get who will get on the program really difficult. They, I mean, one of them described it as they find it a brutally difficult process to go through. And so sort of I think if we put ourselves in their shoes and think, imagine what it's like if we're faced with 2000 applications and we only have 50 uh, graduate um, uh, jobs to, to, that we can award. How are we going to go through that process? What are the things we would think about as we go through the process to go from 2000 probably brilliant, really bright individuals? Uh, that want to work for our business to, to 50. So first of all, it's a really competitive process. And um, I think that's something that needs to be recognized. I mean, obviously there was some brilliant insight from Kate around the recruiting, um, the, the sort of selective universities and, and the recruiting uh, universities. And that was fascinating to hear. But actually it, it, in, in employment, it's gonna be fiercely competitive. And, um, and I think it's really worth remembering that, that ultimately, yeah, it, 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 whether you are successful or not, it isn't always going to be a personal reflection on you. And we'll touch on resilience at the end because I think it's such an important point. But we're never really going to know what the scoring criteria is um, with certain organisations. And, and in our experience as headhunters, we generally find that our clients' priorities and their strategies change year on year. Um, so that's one thing that's, that's really worth remembering. So Kind of as we're going to go through this process, let's imagine we're graduate recruiters, we've got 2,300 applicants, we've got 45 roles that we're able to award, and we need to think, crumbs, this is a competitive process, and the margins between success and failure can be really, really fine, really, really, uh, really small. So there's little details that we're going to try and impart, um, and actually lots of things that I said that Kate shared you could bring into this process as well, will we'll, um, we'll give you a greater chance through that process. So first of all, 2,000 applicants, how are we going to get down to, let's say, 1,000? So let's start looking at those little things first. Um, ben, perhaps, do you want to... Yeah, so I, think, so I think this is, this is a sort of, you know, as, as Edward said, we've got our 2,300 applicants in front of us. We're all sat around a table or a virtual table. And one of the simplest things, and it's it sort of, it's quite a hard thing, in many ways, but to, to go through those applications and really sift out any that have left in any simple errors. So the, the three clients that we spoke to all said, you'd be really surprised the amount of really, really simple errors that people make. So lack of clarity or poor grammar, spelling, um, even leaving in other companies' names that they may have applied to previously. So just that attention to detail. And I think what's really important here to say is, look, you're not on your own. So um, Elam earlier mentioned about neurodiversity, and I think it's a really good point here. No matter whether you have a neurodiverse condition or you don't, make sure you've got lots of support around you. So at least one other person that can read your application before it goes in. If you're fortunate enough to have a, a mentor or friends or family around you, rope in as many people as you can. You know, you could even hopefully find somebody who's perhaps working for a similar organization or even a graduate sort of expert that can have a look at your application for you. So A, don't feel like you're on your own, but B, really, really worth making sure that when you put your application in, all the little errors are all ironed out so that number one, you get over that first hurdle. So let's say we've gotten from 2000, we've gone through our application process and we've you know, had to remove lots of really talented people just because again, we've only got 50 roles to award. We're down to let's say uh, our top 500. So how are we really going to start selecting those top that top that you know how are we going to get down from 500 to our top 100? So we're now going to start really looking for 
um, to get a sense of who you are. You know, there was, I think there was some, I think it was again, some good advice earlier, but I think about that authenticity, who are you? And, and in those personal statements um, and your application form and your CV, employers are gonna to wanna to start to get a sense of who is this person? What are their values? How hardworking are they? What do they believe in? So I think as this, these extra things, as uh, these extracurricular activities as well, start to factor into their scoring. So let's say we've got our top 500, we're gonna start looking for things like um, how proactive they are. You know, we wanna get a sense of, um, you know, whether they're in, uh, busy through the summer with summer internships, whether they uh, play a particular role in a sports team, whether they help their neighbours carry in their shopping. Small things actually can make a huge difference. They're starting to look for um, and get a sense of how proactive you are and how you engage with other people and how, you, um, and how you're likely to perform in a team setting, in a business setting. So this is when, this is when we're going to start to say, we've got brilliant applications, they're well-written, they're grammatically perfect, well, in most cases, um, you know, they're extremely well qualified. How are we going to how are we going to remove some people and how are we going to select others? And it's these small things that they will start to look at, you know, so that so again, some of the advice earlier around trying to get summer work um, and if not and if not work, actually, just, just other things that you can apply yourself to. We'll talk about research, actually, uh, in a few slides time. But I think um, start to think about the industries that you're passionate about the the role that you may want to do in the future and you may not be 100 percent certain on it but there might be some general areas that really interest you so how can you start to um uh, get involved in things read things associate with groups that start to give you some exposure and some experience and some knowledge about those things that you're ulti you ultimately may want to, to to you know to have a job in in future um, I think one other point I would make is actually about universities is that for, from an employer's perspective, it, it was fascinating to learn that employers are now looking for greater diversity of thought. So whereas some employers that we've worked for historically have always taken graduates from certain universities, actually now employers are, are considering a broader pool of, of, of talent from, from universities um, and, different, and, and different universities than perhaps they would have done ordinarily, because they, they, they really are very conscious about wanting to um, have people in their business that reflect the communities that they work in and have different thoughts and ideas. So one, one of the clients we interviewed said, look, you know, to be honest, having a real estate degree, even though we're a real estate business, isn't such a concern for us anymore. We're actually interested in people with, that think differently and have different perspectives. So, but this is this extracurricular piece. So, so now let's say we're down to our top 100 um, applicants and um, um, we still have, we have 50 jobs. So I think Ben, I'll hand over to Ben on this. Um, this is, this is around values and potential. Yeah, thank you. So I think Edward sort of started to refer to it momentarily. If you can maybe move this, the next slide on Ed. Um, so in, in, in similar ways to the experience bit, this is about understanding what the next generations of leaders look like. And I think what's fantastic for us as people who've been in the so people like the recruitment business for over 20 years is we're finally seeing um, employers um, recognize that the next generation of leaders don't need to look like they did. So historically, there's always been this sense of let's recruit in our own image. Whereas in the last five years, and I think increasingly as we go forward, what's really, really encouraging to see is that big organizations, small organizations want to recruit different people. They recognize that the, the world in which you guys will lead businesses will be a very different one to the one we're in today. So starting to think about technology, starting to think about the environment, starting to think about doing the right things for the planet, doing the right things for society, um, and considering um, the, you know, the bigger view. In other words, our company has to make a profit, yes, but actually more importantly, before it can start to do that, it needs to look after the planet, it needs to look after its people and the people it interacts with. So similar to the last sort of point that Ed made, start to think about the things that you're really passionate about. Think about the things that when you go into the employment world, you would like to bring into your, you know, how, how would you like to be seen? How do you want to present yourself? And it's not all, not all about 
just being useful to that company. It's about being useful to everybody and, and, and everybody around you. So this is an opportunity in this part of the process or this part of your application to bring forward even more about you, you know, your emotional intelligence, how you respond to cultural change and challenges. And actually, you know, as migrant leaders, you've got a unique opportunity and perspective because of the challenges that you would have faced in your lives and your education to date to bring to the fore. And the reality is that huge numbers of companies are struggling to gain that perspective. And so you give them an opportunity that they currently don't have. So that for me is a really unique thing that people coming through the Migrant Leaders Program can have and, and can bring forward. That's a really good point then. So, um, so we're, we're sort of down to our, you know, we're, we're, we're getting down to, you know, who we're going to select. And, and this sort of comes around tailoring. So we've heard a lot from the people we've interviewed about, about tailoring personal statements um, and tailoring their application form. And, um, and I think, you know, at this stage, the quality of, of the applicants will be really high and the margins become very fine. And there's some, there's some quotes there from some of the people we interviewed around, you know, applications at this stage just getting rejected because, you know, they haven't thought about that alignment. They haven't thought about, um, I, I would actually want, want to say that actually all of them said we recognise that, um, we recognise that, uh, you know, that young, uh, you know, undergrads, grads are going to have limited work experience, actually. So we're not necessarily expecting all of this amazing professional work experience to suddenly appear. We're just not expecting that. We're looking for potential. So all small, lots of small little things can, can really benefit you. So I think that's important, important to get across. But start to think about how, the, 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 whether it's the volunteering or the summer work or, you know, the hobbies, the research that you're, you're involved in, start to sh show the, show the employer or the organization you're implied you're applying to that you've really you're really thinking about um that industry or that graduate program and that's really important tailoring so ultimately yes i think you know to save yourself the work you're going to need a core application form you probably will have a core sort of blueprint personal statement that you've worked on but then what you'll start to do is tailor that and tweak that for the different types of organizations that you may well apply to. Um, and sort of going that, ex, going that extra mile with research is massively important. I was, I was, I was given a lovely example actually by mm. one of the, the people that I interviewed who said, you know, when it came down to it in the end, um, when we we're selecting somebody to, to give somebody a job and another person not, one particular applicant had taken the time to go onto YouTube and to watch inspirational kind of um, uh, talks and uh, speeches from some of their leaders and then and they'd actually then quoted um uh, and sort of talked about how and why the people they'd listened to speaking inspired them and and things so just little things like that that research and and as it says there in the middle the real winners um are those that are able to align their own values um with the values of the organization that they're, they're they're applying to so it's about being authentic i think that kate made a great point earlier about you know not just trying to sort of um put something across which just isn't really you but it's about looking at the organizations and understanding their values and what they're trying to achieve and if you feel real passion and enthusiasm for those things how can you get that across in your application and how can you tailor that um so uh, we'll talk about sort of volume of volume of work uh, next because it's kind of a labour a labour a laboursome process. But um, I just like to add, just there, it's worth just adding before you do move on. I think don't just look also at their sort of current leaders and what they're doing now, but have a look at um, their corporate social responsibility statements, um, ESG, anything they're looking to do in the future, because it's you know it's also aligning to because ultimately you're going to be the leaders of the future. So have a look at what they're planning to do and how you align to that. That's also really important. Um, so I think, look, you know, this point was made a, you know, a little bit earlier by, by, by um, Elam as well, which is don't give up, you know, be relentless and be resilient. And I, it's easy to sit here and say that, but ultimately I think, as Ed's pointed out, you know, this is a really competitive process for the really big companies, the, the organizations that lots of people want to work for you are one of a few thousand people that may apply. So you're not gonna succeed every single time. So give yourself the chance to succeed by making sure that you're organized, but also make sure that 
Um, just because you get knocked back by a company perhaps that um, you really want to work for, you know, dig deep and go again and, and keep applying and keep moving forward. So don't give up. And I think what I would say there is also make sure that you've got people around you that can support. And I know that, you know, as mentors, people like Edward are going to be there for you. And, you know, what I would also hear is an open offer to anybody on the call today and anyone else invi involved in migrant leaders that, you know, Edward and myself and others at Grange Reese will be here if ever you need to ask questions or want any kind of level of support. So, you know, make sure you've got people around you that can support you to, to make sure that you don't, you know, don't get your heads down and keep going. It's not personal. It's just a process and you've got to make it through that process. But if you keep doing that, you'll get exactly where you want to go. Um, just in terms of, you know, this, this final this slide here in terms of it's, it's a job getting a job. It absolutely is. You know, this isn't something you can just do a little bit of here and there. You've got to be as organized as you would be doing your um, applications for university and even the coursework and exams you do while at uni. You've got to treat it in exactly the same way. You've got to be organized. You've got to put, you know, put, put time in your diaries to do this and, and, um, and work on it. You know, from year one onwards, it may be only small amounts in year one, slightly more in year two, but then in year three, you really need to get your heads into a place about how am I going to bring all of this to life? So when I'm applying for jobs, I've got all of the work done. So what you're not doing then is scrambling around trying to remember things you've done over the last 18 years of your life. You've got a really nice blueprint to work from. So don't think it's just going to happen. It's ultimately your responsibility. Um, and don't take it personally. You know, see it as a process and I'm sure you'll all succeed. There's a really, I mean, I'm sure everyone's seen it because it's, it, it, but, but if you haven't, it's, it's worth Googling um, something called the success iceberg. Is that if you put in like the, the iceberg, the iceberg I, think it's, I think it's called the success iceberg, but it's a lovely illustration of how there's, there's, there are bound to be people in all of our lives. I, I would hope that we admire, whether that's people we know or just people professionally or, uh, you know, whether it's sort of other, other people, celebrities or whatever, but we, we see the success, we see how talented they are. We see, you know, we've just heard a lo lovely story around how they has secured this uh, role at um, a, a university and been through that process. So you see the success, but as Elam illustrated, you know, and, and, and the sort of picture of the iceberg shows it beautifully that under the surface, there's just a struggle, there's rejection and rejection after rejection after rejection, there's all the hours and the hard work and no one generally sees that. It's a lovely, uh, lovely picture that sort of illustrates um, uh, th th this nicely, the thing that Ben's just shared. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of, I think it'd be nice to hear, I think it'd be nice to hear if, if it's okay, if, there, if there's anyone's willing um, from the Migrant Leaders team, perhaps to talk about their own experiences of, of rejection and, having to sort of battle through you know over and over again to to, to get where they to get where they are now actually as, as, as some examples actually before we finish if anyone's happy to, to share I can I can share um my own experience of uh, rejection if you like um, I know I have a three and I know Kate Graham has <laughs> um so I think fr okay. from my side um Obviously, when you talk about people like us, you know, me, Fawzia, Kate and others who've got, um, you know, 15, 20, 25 years of work behind them, our tendency is to, um, to kind of say what worked well and to sort of um, showcase our successes. But the truth is behind it all, for all of us, myself included, there has been plenty of rejection, plenty of failure, and plenty of bad luck and plenty of good luck. That's the normal part of anyone's story. And I can tell you that uh, when I graduated from um, my first degree in 1994, it was um, uh, until then that one of the worst or the worst graduate recruitment year uh, uh, that had ever existed apparently but I decided that I'm not just a number I'm not just a statistic that I'm going to beat the odds uh, and I'm going to apply to as many um, good jobs uh, in companies uh, small medium size as well as big companies as I can um, and I applied to something like 400 jobs and um, rejection after rejection after rejection arrived in the post with a small short paragraphs to say, uh, thank you for your application. Unfortunately, on this occasion, uh, you have not been successful. 
And I made a point of um, writing back to all of the rejected rejections to try and get some feedback. And I can only recall from all the letters and phone calls I made, I only had one or two who were able to give feedback because obviously with so many applicants, to be fair to them, they can't give feedback to everyone. And I remember thinking, um, my God, I've filed three big files of rejections and it felt bad, obviously, but I knew that I've got to keep going. And this is simply a function of three things. One, it's a numbers game. I've got to apply to more and more jobs to increase the probability of landing a good job. B, it's about the quality of my applications. So having a blueprint to begin with and learning from those experiences and really uh, front loading the application effort you put so that you, your, your first one or two applications, um, you put most of your effort in so that that becomes your blueprint to then customize for future applications. And then three is to look after your mindset so that you remain positive and resilient and determined. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the rest, you know, it all worked out all right at the end because things yeah. at the end do tend to work out all right for people who are rel rel relentless and who work hard. Um, mm -hmm. I always say hard work does magic. Um, you know, hard work is probably one of the biggest accelerators uh, mm -hmm. I have come across. Nice. Yeah. I would add resilience is also key. You do have to kind of learn from your mistakes, learn from what went wrong, figure out how to do something differently the next time, and then keep building and keep building. Um, and I know I, I am not following Elham's example, but I actually applied for one graduate programme when I was still um, in my final year. And um, I built, it was one of the major retailers in the UK, and I would whittle down to, I don't know from how many applications, must have been hundreds, and to the mm. final two, and it took ages and ages and didn't get a response, didn't get a response. And in the end, it turned out that I wasn't given the position because my competitor had um, some experience that I didn't have a writing experience. And um, part of why I'm delighted to work in Migrant Leaders is that those are the things that I didn't know at the time. So having this opportunity to share this sort of information with people about what you can be doing to make yourself competitive. I've kind of just had to make my own way um, with a bit of support from friends along the way. Um, so hopefully pick up some of the tips that everybody has kindly shared with us here, your applications together. Thanks very much, Edward and Ben. I think that was a really helpful presentation. And I think it's really helpful to look at things from a different perspective as well. Um, one of the messages that we always give to people is think about who you're writing for. So looking at it from the employer's perspective is, a, is um, such an interesting angle and something that people may not have thought about. If there's any questions, I'm mindful of time, but if there are any questions that people have either now or afterwards, happy to answer them afterwards by email or whatever's easy. Great stuff. And we'll also be sharing the slides with everybody um, and we'll make those available. Thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Okay.